I've been able to like see people. Yeah, it's pretty cool. We can put it on the gallery mm -hmm. here. Speaker view. Hello, everybody. View. Look at how many folks. Mm -hmm. Nice turnout. Okay. Let's see, got somebody requesting the link. I'm just going to send it to them. Hi, everybody, and welcome to, oh, I got a siren going here. I hope it doesn't get too, too loud. Uh, welcome to St. Francis College, uh, though we are not physically in St. Francis College, but St. Francis College's first right in Brooklyn event of the fall of 2020. Uh, I'm so excited to introduce our, our guests for the evening. Uh, um, we've been talking about putting this together for a while, a really while, a long while, and finally made it happen thanks to some Zoom magic. And uh, I'm so grateful you know, for Isaac and, and Saeed for joining us. Um, I just did want to just say a couple words about who we are and what we're doing, who's bringing you this, this terrific event this evening. Uh, so I'm Theo Ganji. I'm the director of the MFA program in creative writing in uh, St. Francis College. Uh, we are, in fact, the only low residency MFA program in New York City. Um, we meet uh, you know, twice a, twice a year uh, in person. And uh, although it's been uh, remote these last couple of times, obviously, and uh, we bring some really terrific writing talent to, uh, to our students. And we have, we've had on faculty such terrific writers as Marlon James, Booker, uh, Booker winner, uh, Jamel, Brink Jamel Brinkley, um, Mahogany Brown is our poetry coordinator who has our next event coming up. So we're, we're really excited about all of these things happening. Uh, we offer tracks in poetry and fiction, obviously, and uh, uh, screenwriting. So if you have any questions about the, want to know more about the, the college, I will put a link to the program in the chat and you can check us out or email me or message me, or however the case may be. Uh, now, on to the fun part. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, introduce first uh, Saeed. Uh, Saeed Jones um, is the author of the memoir, How We Fight for Our Lives, winner of the 2019 Kirkus Prize for Nonfiction, the 2020 Stonewall Book Award, an Israel Fishman non -book, uh, Nonfiction Award, and the 2020 uh, Lamba Literary Award. He is also the author of the poetry collection, Prelude to Bruise, winner of the 2015 Penn Joyce Arstowell Awards for Poetry and the 2015 Stonewall Book Award slash Barbara Giddings Literature Award. The poetry collection was a finalist for the 2015 National Book Circle Critics Circle Award, as well as awards from uh, Lambda Literary and the Publishing Triangle in 2015. He lives in Columbus, Ohio, Ohio and tweets it at The Ferocity. Uh, and joining him is uh, Isaac Fitzgerald, who's been a firefighter, worked on a boat, and was once given a sword by a king, thereby accomplishing three out of five of his childhood goals. After making a bunch of cool things for the internet, he now writes books and lives in Brooklyn and joins us from time to time at the MFA program. Uh, Isaac, I'm so excited for tonight, Saeed. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Uh, take it away, folks. Hi, thank you. Hello. <laughs> Isaac, how are you like strategically silent clapping? Are you muted? Oh, am, am I? Did that not? Oh, okay, you're back. I hear you. We're okay, back. let me just tell you, I just like to clap because that is one of the most <laughs> awkward things about these Zoom things. Okay. There's no actual applause, so I like to fill that in. But Theo's absolutely fantastic. But let's talk about your look. Okay, I see some requests for Caesar. Let's talk about um, Caesar. 
So he's this is his cameo. He won't. We'll see how long he wants to stay in my lap. He's. I. I don't know about your pets, um, but uh, Caesar got used to Zoom very quickly. So um, he doesn't find sitting on my lap especially interesting. But you know, hello, here he is. He's just... oh, no, come on. He's he's looking to lick. He's looking for a little lick. Hi. Hello. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Why he's so if only if only he knew. Hi, Canetta and Yellow Springs, Ohio. God, you were so popular. You were so famous. He has no idea. He's actually very no. shy. Caesar knows. I th I would argue that Caesar absolutely knows. <laughs> um, but I was wondering, do you think you could start us off with like a little reading? First off, sure. I like a compliment before we get into it though. Your Zoom situation. Oh, a plus. You got that. Thank you. you. Got the underline. Oh my God, it's all for you. The eyeliner is for you. Is is I'm there? Sure. Is there like? Do you have a soft purple bulb somewhere? What's? It's beautiful. Oh, thank you. I mean, you know, I I've been I was actually thinking um today about one how like practically Zoom doing virtual Zoom events uh makes me clean my apartment up a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, you know, it, and it's weird because I think I, I try to like have boundaries, as you know, between like my public life, my home life and everything like that. And the pandemic has upended it, but I hope like, it's like, I don't know, like you're, you're sitting on your couch in the living room. Like, I hope there's like some sense of transparency about like, yeah, like writers, we're people like everyone else, like try however polished our writing might come across, you know, we're going through it like everybody else. So that's my positive spin. We've got our Ariana Grande posters <laughs> in the background. Know her, know her. The only white person on a wall in my home. Because <laughs> um, I grew up, my mom, I grew up in a household where we, we did not have greeting cards featuring white people in my family. Um, and we did not have art on the walls <laughs> featuring white people. But I feel like, as we all know, Ariana Grande is not white, she is tanned um so that's my i can't go in on that joke but i'll just say that i love uh in my house there's a lot of popes a lot of jfk and i love okay. the i love the the idea that your mom was like absolutely not but you were like no no for the woman that has put out this it's different this high caliber music we're gonna allow it. totally different totally different um but yeah so i i thought um this is you know tonight's very special i think it's fun i um, I'm fortunate that I happen to be friends with a lot of writers who I adore and, and respect, but Isaac is my best friend and we talk every day <laughs> 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 and FaceTime usually twice a week. I mean, twice that's week, kind of- on the regular. Since, that's been since our, the pandemic, yeah. That's our pandemic rhythm and I enjoy it. And, and I got to say it's effortless. It doesn't feel like, oh, it's time for like my, you know, and um, so it's really nice to kind of to get to do an event with you. And I hope y'all watching, I mean, in, welcome. I, I don't know, you know, we'll do our best to keep it spicy. Um, wait, have I frozen or is Isaac frozen? I don't think me? that'll be a problem keeping it spicy at all. Okay. I think we're all good. Okay, okay. cool. All right. Play, play uh, through it, baby. Okay, so I'm gonna read, so um, in, um, I was looking um, in the fall of 2014, which is like, 3.5 lifetimes ago, to be perfectly honest, um, you know, and at least like seven jobs ago for the two of us together. Um, Isaac and Wendy McNaughton published uh, a wonderful book called Pins and in Ink, which was an uh, illustrated um, collection of people's stories about significant tattoos they've gotten. And Isaac asked me to write an essay about it for Tumblr. Remember? Remember Tumblr. <laughs> Tumblr doesn't remember. It was, Tumblr doesn't it, remember. It was truly, it was like the book was coming out, but it was like, mm -hmm. we could do this as mm -hmm. a way to keep people like excited yeah. about the book. I remember I asking it. you if you would do that. I love it. And, and so um, I decided to write um, about my first tattoo. I don't know if you can see it. I'm not really good at the- No, you got it. It's a, can you see it? Can you see the little Basquiat crown? And as it hasn't happens, like, so there's, this tattoo, the crown, which you will soon hear about, the arrow, um, and then my other tattoo, my wrist. Oh no, this is not working. 
Is it happening? Oh, there we go. We got it. There you go. Oh, I'm not turning upside down. This is the most recent tattoo. It's an allusion to the waves at the end of the memoir. I point them all out, not just because they're fabulous and my skin is glistening, um, but because all of the tattoos I've gotten, um, I've gotten with Isaac. I <laughs> yet to walk into a tattoo parlor without uh, this man in tow. So this is the story of the first one <laughs> that I got. And it's September 2014. Gosh, so long ago. Um, I met my friend Isaac for the first time within a few weeks of holding a steak knife against my wrist. My mother had died suddenly and taken my understanding of the world along with her. Her heart stopped the night before Mother's Day, and almost a year later, I sat across from Isaac in a dive bar in New York, telling him what my apocalypse had looked like. All I knew for sure was that I was lost, unsure of what to do next. So I just kept talking. Without knowing me well, he somehow managed to know me perfectly. You're gonna come visit me in San Francisco, he said. You're gonna crash on my couch. Eventually I did. Friends come into our lives for all kinds of reasons. Isaac came to teach me how to say yes to the rest of my life. I would tell him about the book I was working on and he'd convince me it was going to be the best book ever written. Isaac rarely looks happier than when he is championing the work and lives of his friends. He made me feel like I was a king, even if I had no claim to a crown. Saying yes got easier and more important each time. Yes, like a heartbeat that won't quit, Yes, like a promise to keep trying. Yes, like a brass knuckle. We promised each other that if I could keep saying yes for an entire year, we would get matching crown tattoos. Basquiat would paint little gold imperfect crowns above objects he loved most in his paintings. After a year of yes, Isaac and I trudged through a blizzard in Brooklyn until we made it to a tattoo shop called Three Kings. If you say yes enough, your life starts saying yes back. Isaac and I have crowns etched in our skin because if you want to stake a claim to your life, it begins with shouting, I am my own kingdom. <laughs> Right, there's something to be said for like the you know the applause okay I love yeah that. no absolutely and I, I that's one thing that zoom culture has taught me i understand why laugh tracks existed <laughs> but truly said that absolutely means the world to me and it's very hard for me not to get emotional every time you read it as you know i'm an emotional man you are that, that is just the truth but seriously uh i mean just Everybody that's watching. Yeah, oh, oh, see if I can. There's the one that I've same got. Time. Oh, it's all happening. And we do. We have we have multiple matching tattoos at this point. Um, another. Also, one. I gotta say, your tat, your your hand tattoo. It's I now that I know a little bit more about tattoos than I did at the time. I have a lot more appreciation for how good your tattoo artist was because, he, like all of the little the details, you know, yeah, making it look, that stuff. Yeah, great. kind of making it look like an ink, you know, like it it maintained. It's good. I like Shout it. out to Matt Moreno who oh, works okay. on the West Coast these days, but still comes back to Three Kings Tattoo in Greenpoint, where we did that back in December. Uh, still around, wonderful tattoo artist. I but seriously that. That, that piece means so much to me because I don't, to be honest, I don't know if I've heard it read aloud or even maybe even read it since the book came out. And so yeah, your, your I, book, I think you're right. Your book, How We Fight for Our Lives, which I just, there's a part of me, of course, there's a part of me that's like, bitch, told you stuff. Um, <laughs> Cause that book, it went on to win the Kirkus, all of those prizes that Theo talked about when he introduced you. Um, but that book, it came out in October of last year, which again was, was years after we got those tattoos, but you stuck with it, you believed in yourself, you kept writing. And I want to ask, like, how does it feel having that book out for a year? What has this last year been like for you? <laughs> um, you know, uh, I am not a runner. You are a walker. 
uh, an avowed uh, daily walker. Um, I, I, I have to imagine it, it, it feels a bit like someone who, um, let's say, completed the New York Marathon after, you know, maybe not just like months, but like years of it being a goal and you, um, you, you keep the like little medallion or, or, or some memento from it, you know, and it's not just the doing, but the knowing that you've done it that lives with you and in you. It means so much to me that I finished the book and um, books are special, but I think memoirs are especially special um, because, uh, you know, this self-reflection, this relationship with how you have come into your current iteration of being is is wrapped up in in the writing and the form so it's not just a book it's a book that tells um an important story about an important part of my life and i'm grateful um to have finished it um because it was really hard as you know as a friend that i would confide in i mean it's you know you often feel like am i going to finish this is it going to be worth it you know and um I'm grateful that before the critical attention and the like the accolades came, I think I'm I'm grateful that based on feedback from like black queer people in particular and and, and different kinds of um, audiences, I knew that I had done what I set out to, which was to put another book on the shelf that would honor the humanity of people who so often don't feel that their stories are honored or invited in into how we think of like the great American story, you know? And, and so um, before the accolades, I, I kind of came to understand I'd done that. Um, and then everything else since then has been very nice. And um, I think, you know, we don't just create art in a vacuum, we create art in time. And I'm tremendously grateful that like last fall, I got to go on a national book tour that took me to something like 19 cities. Um, little did I know how special that would be to travel the country and to talk about race and class and sex and power and identity, you know, before we were all like, that's it. Um, and to see people. <laughs> to see people and to, you know, be all over. But yeah, I mean, it's it's really special. And, and I think kind of going on an experience like that and having the conversations that a book like that has allowed to happen um, in a way has personally prepared me, I think, for this year. And I feel myself kind of drawing from and building upon the conversations that the book kind of started because... I mean, you know, when I think about my mother, for example, who's a big part of the memoir, I think about how Black women in the United States have been uniquely impacted by the pandemic, right? And, and so it feels like the book has kind of taught me and continues to teach me. Well, I, you, you have a very famous quote, uh, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, I believe it was with an interview, an interview or a profile that was written of you in which you said Black women are the future. Yep. It was a quote that you had, and, and, and I think really speaks to how the, the moment that we've been this year, right? Because you, this, this, the pandemic and then everything else that's been going on this year has been an incredibly, incredibly difficult time. And so I wanted to ask a little bit, when you said that, obviously this was before, you know, mm -hmm. what made you think of that like as that? Like Black women are the future. What did you mean by that when you said that? Um, I think my understanding of queerness, um, my understanding of politics, which is very much rooted, and I've been spending a lot of time with her work lately, in part because of Roxane Gay's wonderful new edition of Audre Lorde's selected works, but, you know, someone deeply rooted in, in, in Audre Lorde's teachings, um, I just have kind of come to understand um, what Malcolm X understood when, you know, he said, like, no one in America is more disrespected than the Black woman. And, and I think when you understand that, there is, um, there is the potential for 
for growth. There, when, when, when we can think about how America um, and, and the multiple fronts of oppression um, and acrimony impact Black women in particular, if we can really wrap our minds about it, appreciate it thoughtfully, not turning Black women into a resource, not turning them into a like, thank you, like I so appreciate, you know, like that, oh, like I'm not, it's, that's not what I'm trying to point to. I'm trying to say that if we can be more thoughtful and appreciate how they live at the crossroads of so many threads of American culture, so many threads of power, I think we can better understand America um, itself, because they do. <laughs> no, absolutely. They understand America. <laughs> at, at its absolute core, and for all everything that is wrong, like, absolutely, I agree with that 100%. What did that mean for you, though? Because these were obviously all thoughts that you had in you before you started writing this project, which, if we're being honest, right? This is a mm -hmm. book that is about your mother. Mm -hmm. And and not to dive too deep too early, but did working on this book, learning what you learned and continue to learn and, and knew at the time about America, did it change the way that you thought of your mother, that you remembered your mother, mm. that you wrote your mother? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, um, I had, I was fortunate to have had a vibrant, warm, uh, funny relationship with my mom before she passed away. We still have a relationship, right? But um, we laughed and loved and, and talked about politics and culture and, and fashion and everything um, all the time. Um, and so, and each other all the time. <laughs> so when my mom passed away, you know, the grief was overwhelming. It's a grief like, you know, like I, I think it's akin to kind of infatuation or, or you know, just falling head over heels in love with someone. It, it, it is, it's almost like that person becomes the sun and you're trying to see them and you kind of can't and, but you, you just want to. And even when you close your eyes, you can feel the heat on your eyelid. You know, it's just, it's just a lot. And um, that was hard. I, I think in grieving my mother for a while, um, my mother ceased to be a person. She, mm -hmm. she ceased to be a human mm -hmm. being who mattered beyond how much I missed her. And I think only in writing the memoir um, and having to go back and slow, because in writing a memoir, you don't just go back, you then kind of have to slow down, you know what I mean? And, and spend time with yourselves and your loved ones at, at different time periods and in these moments. And I found that though I don't think of writing as therapy, I don't think writing is inherently healing. Um, I think for me in some, the act of working on the book and the way she figures into the writing of the book, yeah, it helped me recontextualize her as a human being, as a person um, with limitations, with imperfections, um, with you know, moments in which it was clear that I think she was tired and frustrated and, you know, not exactly thrilled to be a single mom having to navigate money problems and son problems and America problems all at once, you know. So I think, yeah, it kind of helped me, um, I don't know, maybe like realign is the word, which I think is maybe the best we can hope for um, when writing about our loved ones. It's not going to like solve the relationship. I certainly can't go back. The book did not bring her back. Um, but I think, you know, because as a writer, I tend to like, even with myself, I thought of myself as a third person character. Um, I, I, you know, when I was thinking, I was like, what is Saeed doing? Is <laughs> What is Saeed thinking, you know, in the writing? And that's how I treated her. And so I think that was helpful in terms of, you know, something that frankly all men need to do, which is come to understand the women in our lives removed from, from us. You know what I mean? Like who are they beyond what they have done or not done for who we are? A hundred percent. And, and, and to speak of that too, and I'm working on a memoir right now, and that's why I'm interested in this conversation, right? It's also you're engaging with these memories that you had as a child. Mm. all of a sudden you're seeing them through the lens of being an adult, right? 
where you maybe have more understanding and you have more clarity and and like you're saying you can see them as a full dimensional person and so part of part of the process and i i do want to say that it's something that i really thought shined in the book was your portrayal of your mother as a full like it's hard it's so often in memoirs you can read things and they become two-dimensional or and this is a terrible way to put it but almost like plot devices Mm-hmm. Her mother stood profoundly on her own. You were actually almost in orbit of her, and not almost in orbit, absolutely in orbit. Of, and I just thought that that was absolutely fantastic. So, sorry. Thank you. I don't think I've ever said that to you in your face. <laughs> That's just the truth. But all right, but let's get into the crap. Let's get into okay. what it was to write a memoir. I just, let's, let's start easy. Awful. <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, actually, that's great. I'm glad you said that. Awful. This is my question. Which part of the process did you enjoy? <laughs> uh, none of it. Um, no, I, I, well, I would say <laughs> um, in terms of enjoying the writing process, not much, Bob, um, but I, I would say um, as a poet, as someone who uh, loves lyricism and, and really has an appreciation for the scenic route, uh, for catching the spirit, for those moments when, you know, the jazz riff, the, you know, where it's just like, I know this isn't the verse, but you're going to get your life. And you're going to like love watching Ella Fitzgerald, like sing the same song in three different ways, you know, that I, I, I love. And um, because a memoir compared to a poem is like so big, um, I really enjoyed discovering opportunities um, to interject lyricism. There's a moment in a book that actually I remember showing it to you. Um, this is early. This was, you know, before I sold the book, before I fully understood what the book was, but I was living in San Francisco. So this would be 2011, 2012. I remember I worked on it in a bar, Clooney's, oh, no. um, which was around the corner from your yeah, apartment. They had Wi-Fi. Um, a bar that, guys, did y'all know there are bars that are open at six o'clock in the morning? I didn't. <laughs> well, I know this guy. The right one. Um, anyway, I sat in Clooney's and, and there's a section in the book where I finally get my driver's license and I'm able to drive my mom's car by myself now and then for a while, you know, and it, it, and it like doesn't have the plot aspect of that moment is like, I'm angry and I'm desperate for independence. Right. But like, maybe I could have said that in a sentence, but I think one of the joys of, of writing the memoir is that I was able to write several paragraphs about just like what it felt like to be in the car driving down the back roads of Louisville, Texas, past fields full of um, wildflowers and, and just that, that feel of motion um, that is akin to rage. <laughs> um, and you know that, that isn't hurting anyone, and um, I love that, and 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 that was a real joy. Um, that kind of finding that, oh, this can happen here. The jazz, this riff bit of, yeah, this little bit mm-hmm. of discovery. Do, what, in in general, is that how a lot of this? Just just for those in the the audience that are that are writers and are interested in this, you know, it was not you didn't just sit down and play. And, 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 and the whole manuscript was done. Did you do it kind of piece by piece? Did you find those moments and then figure out how to stitch them together? What was kind of the process like? Um, that's a great question. I think I understood the tent poles of the book. So I guess I would say going into writing the book, I understood in part because the tent poles of the book, not all of them, but most of them were iterations of personal essays I'd already written. I mean, you edited at least one of them for The Rumpus, which you, you know, you um, ran um, for years. Um, so it was, it's kind of like, I imagine um, what the white men who run Marvel do, um, where like, you know, they know years in advance before those of us who aren't full on comic book nerds, they know when the like next big adventures movie is coming. The next big movie when everybody comes together and everything in this fictional universe is supposed to change. Okay, so they do that. They know those moments. And then I think they figure out like the secondary moments when like um, the major, you know, in this case, like for them, you know, the major four heroes 
have their films and then they scabble down from that <laughs> to like new characters or characters who will matter, matter more later and maybe one of the stars has like a cameo you know it's kind of this reverse engineering and yeah that's that's kind of how we wrote the book. Um, this first time I've used that as an analogy, but damn it, it works. No, um, I'm, I'm, I'm taking notes. Keep get talking. into it, get Keep into talking. it. Because, and the reason I think it's helpful is because it is just understandably so easy to get lost, overwhelmed. I mean, look at me, like I spent an entire day writing about driving down a back road and it like had nothing to do with like much of anything else you know and i think the only reason i could see the value in the long term in in writing about something like a, such a lyric moment was because i kind of understood the universe and the hierarchy of moments i was building and so yeah that was it i will say i am not someone who i've never had like a um you know, like a wall covered in index cards or like storyboard. Some people do, right? Some people, you know, or like an elaborate outline. Um, for me, it's more, I guess when I say the tent pole, the big moments, I, I understood the turning points, um, the moment, you know, um, and, and, and sometimes it could be subtle as, Remember when you hooked up with that guy and you felt awful afterwards? I'm thinking of the botanist, for example. Right. And remember how you felt when you walked out of his house mm -hmm. and what you said to him. Okay, how do we get you there? Not just in terms of the night of your evening with him, but what do you need to kind of stitch in to the storytelling so that that moment, as you remember it, has something akin to the same gravity for a reader who doesn't know you from Adam. You know, no. that, that was what I was trying to do. And something that can speak to the reader. And, and starting maybe so early as finding the photograph in the Baldwin book when you were a child, how does one get from that moment to that and kind of it sounds like you kind of wrote your way through it, which I think is fantastic. Let's talk about, though, real quick, because you brought him up, the botanist. That was on you. I wasn't going to go there unless, but <laughs> I do. I, I Waiting would for him to pop up in the chat. <laughs> like, hi, it's. <laughs> no, to that, I won't lie. That's going to be the follow-up question to this. But, like, firstly, let, sex is hard to write about. Is it? Okay, go on. Uh, well, for some, I believe sex is hard to write about. Loaded sex to me seems like even more precarious. Just walk us through a little bit of your process. I, I mean, it sounds like for you, you're actually like, actually I loved writing about the sex aspects, not the loaded aspects, which if that's the case, God bless. But like how you, you, you really walked a line, it felt like, especially through that chapter. Um, and of course, also I'm thinking of the Arizona uh, student chapter as well. How, how, how do you find where your line is, where you want to be, and how to best tell those kinds of stories? Well, I mean, you know, everything I write for a book has an editor. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, my wonderful editor, Jonathan Cox, who knows all of my, I should have made, I should have made that white boy sign an NDA. <laughs> He knows things. Um, I, Julia's like, ooh, eyes emoji, good question. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, so in, in the, the long run, yes, it, it, I had deep trust of my editor. I, that's part of why I decided to work with it. I remember being like, I need to work with an editor who I don't feel like I need to have like queer life, queer sex 101 um, conversations with. You know what I mean? I was not interested and I'm still not interested in working with someone that I have to explain, I don't know, what's a glory hole or what's, you know, I'm just like, girl, go to Google, I'm not the one. You know what I mean? Um, and so that helped tremendously because John, either he just Googled before he asked me or he just like has an understanding, a relative understanding of, you know, queer culture and um, was comfortable as an ally, because he's a straight man, asking questions, pushing back in a way that wasn't laced with his own anxiety. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It wasn't about his nerves. Because I think sometimes you can, when you can work with someone who doesn't share your identity, and this is something that I think all writers and everyone in publishing are navigating, whether they admit it or not, the other side of working with white people who are trying to be empowering is that I think they can be too hands off. Mm -hmm. 
And I've read work from writers who are not straight, cisgender white men. And I'm just like, your editor abandoned you. Maybe they lovingly abandoned you, but they were like, too, like, that's my girl. Like, too, I, don't you know that, I don't know how to have that conversation. Yeah, I'm just like, yeah. well, all of the line edits, yes, queen, because that's what it reads like, you know? Mm -hmm. So I say all that to say, like, I wasn't getting like, yes, queen. Like, I was, like, he sh was just like, what's the point of the scene? What are we learning about you, you know? Um, and that was important. The reason I don't think writing about sex, and even, quite frankly, the darker, more disturbing sex scenes that appear in the book, which are most of the sex scenes, is there a fun sex? There's one fun sex scene in the book. This one truly delightful, the first college party on the trampoline. That is just a fun blow job. It really is. Threesome between that, friends. That is Papa, just, Java. yeah, yeah. I'm still in touch with that guy. He's doing great. <laughs> um, he, recently, he recently adopted a lovely little boy. Anyway, <laughs> um, I, I, I think writing about sex to me is not easy, but I don't think it's especially hard. One, because I think sex is uh, on the page kind of boring. I don't think it's like luring or uniquely exciting. I'm just like, I don't know. It's uh, like, like any bit of dialogue is a thing that's happening. You know what I mean? So I don't bring that anxiety to it. And, and I do think what's interesting about sex is that, um, especially for Americans, it's a rare moment in which we are having to be candid um, physically or verbally about what we want, what we're doing. You know, it's a moment where your characters, whether they're contradicting themselves in real time or owning, you know, what they want and how they feel in real time, it, the motivations are all there. The power dynamics are no longer metaphorical. You know what I mean? And, and so to me, I think it's really interesting. And so I would say to um, prepare for writing the sex scenes for the memoir, I, and this might be a little on the nose if you know where the book goes in the Phoenix chapter, I studied Norman Mailer's writing about boxing um, because I think, you know, reading about how he writes about like Muhammad Ali, like straight up, like opponents. The physicality. <laughs> the physicality. For that, that's one of the challenges. Oh yeah. I, I helped edit that fucking essay and I didn't know that part of it. Oh that. yeah, I got one of the white man's books in here. One of the few in no my shit. collection. Yeah, because it is it's it, you know, it's it's both the physicality, you know, realizing opportunities to describe the body, what we're doing, to think about it, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and also because boxers like sexual partners are two people with agendas that might not that are not the same agenda and you know and and, and they're, you're following through on that so yeah I don't know I thought it, I think writing about sex is easy in, in a way because it's just a little more on the surface you kind of think about where each person is coming from and how they're taking up space I think that's mm -hmm. a fascinating answer that's fantastic I also will say that I see Chris Martinez said Isaac I recall you writing a strap-on piece that you mentioned on Antioch LA. I'll remind the audience. Get him, Chris. I, Get him, Chris. I'm talking to Saeed about I this. Love Thank it. you very much. I'm asking I questions. Love it. I'm asking questions here. Um, that's it. To, to get the, like you said, there is, there are many different scenes, uh, of course, later in the book, which, you know, not, but like there's, there's the car, the car moment. There's so many different things. But to oh, think right. about, I forgot about the car moment. To think about the botanist, and 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 that person in Arizona. Do you ever, as as a memoirist, to take us out of the work for a little bit and just now the book exists in the world and how that feels for you? Do you ever think about maybe they read it, maybe they come across it? Is that is that something that interests you? You don't care about it at all? I think it's interesting. Um, I, you know, certainly when the book was coming out, first coming out, I was. Um, a little nervous. I, 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 for whatever reason, Cody was the person. Actually, I just had an image of standing up at the back, remind, at the back remind, of a book. Remind, remind so, book so Cody appears in the book as as the complicated first crush 
um, you know, you meet him in, in you, you, well, he appears in the first chapter and then the second chapter is really about him um, and his brother. Um, and he also ends up being the first person to use a gay slur against me, uh, the specific gay slur. And um, yeah, I, I remember being like, you know, cause I did like a book event in Dallas in, in the Dallas area where I grew up. And I remember being like, oh, what if Curry shows up? Um, I, yeah, so I don't know, I, 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 you know, I called the, I made very specific um, craft decisions in terms of how I wrote about the botanist mm -hmm. um, because I, I, I did want to respect his privacy while being candid about his humanity, if that makes sense. Um, so I, you know, I tried to make space for that. I mean, he did what he did. I mean, and that's kind of how I feel about any anyone in the book. I, I was, I, I really tried to be honest with myself and I would argue hard on myself as someone who, you know, you and I were coworkers for a while um, as, as a poet in a memoirs who was in a newsroom when I was working on most of the book and, and I really learned from and tried to absorb um, what our colleagues as journalists were are always navigating mm -hmm. in terms of ethics. And, and then fake news became a thing at one point. I was really like, oh yeah, ain't nobody gonna come after me talking about, you know what I mean? So yeah, so I try to like be very clear about like, are you sure that's what happened? You know, and being aware of, I only you can know this for yourself as a writer, but I do think when we are writing uh, nonfiction, more memoir-driven writing. I do feel there is a shimmery, kind of like an annihilation, like a shimmery boundary, when I think we can begin to feel, if we're honest with ourselves, when we are pushing past what we remember. Yeah. I do that. And it takes time. Like what usually would happen is that my editor would keep asking for more and more elaboration on a section. Mm -hmm. And I would try and try and try. And I thought the, the, the reason I was struggling was just like a writing issue. And eventually um, I would realize that it was because I don't think I remember it well enough and I feel uncomfortable. So in the Memphis 1999 chapter, for example, going to church with my grandmother, um, I that summer had a huge crush, crush on the um, youth group leader at that church. He mm -hmm. gave me two, I believe, two WWJD bracelets. Ooh. He played the guitar. Oh, good hands. I was smitten. And, and so I ended up that summer, in addition to everything else that happens that summer, it was just like everything's happening in Memphis in 1999 with Saeed and Mildred Sweet. Um, but I, I ended up going to do like proselytizing things. Like we went to a random su suburb in Memphis, Tennessee, knocking on people's doors together. And for me, I felt like the bell of the ball because I somehow got it so that the two of us were paired together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I tried to write about it, but I, it wasn't, it just didn't work. He, he was a flat care. It just what it was a flat carrot. It was like months of notes from my editor. And I finally was just like, I don't think I'm lying to myself about something. And we don't have time right now for me to figure out what it is. <laughs> I don't you know, know what I mean? <laughs> every cut it. Just... Right. So let's err on the side of cutting it. And that's what I did. So it's a long way of saying that, yes, I'm a human being. I, I do not like the idea of unintentionally causing pain to people. If I mean to hurt you, I want to hurt you. But unintentionally, that is not something I want to do. I do not want to write a memoir about crawling out of the crucible of my identity and then look up and people are like, well, you've inspired my own memoir because this has been traumatic to me, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I just found the way to do that was to be honest about when I felt like, is this memory or like hurt that I'm drawing from for this section? Yeah, and, and, and again, to be honest, I think that's why those characters work in it and not to try and tie two different things together here. Uh, obviously coming from very, very vastly different spaces, but it's the same way in which you treated your own mother in the book is you saw the humanity in these characters. And anytime you, it sounds like, you know, that section that you're just discussing that was cut, obviously a much tamer section, but just like, oh, this is becoming two dimensional. There's something I'm missing here. In that case, it's not worthwhile, which is amazing. I just want to say a couple of things to the folks that are following along 
please do feel free to start dropping questions in because we're going to open it up to the rest of the class very soon. We'd love to select a few questions from the audience. Um, but I've got a, a couple of last ones here. Um, okay. which, the, 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 the first one, and, and, and just because we're in that zone, we're talking about this, what it was to write memoir. Um, and it is. Your book has basically been out for a year. Uh, is there any advice other than, I mean, what you just said seems very worthwhile, but any advice you have for writers that are trying to start to turn their life, and let's be honest, sometimes one's trauma into work? Mm. Um, no one's going to take care of you. Mm. Um, the internet is not going to take care of you. People liking, people liking your essay or your book does not mean they care about you. They may think they do. They might, but they can't take care of you. And um, success in terms of how we define it, either in terms of writing an article or an essay that goes viral, which is you know, something that I think a lot of us hope for, because that, that does open opportunities. Absolutely. Um, or publishing a book that, you know, gets critical praise or what in, in both of those scenarios, what part of what is happening, what's inherent in that is a loss of control. Mm. You know, mm. um, what's great about writing poetry and, you know, writing Prelude to Bruce, for example, is because the, the scale of attention is very different. So I have a lot more control over that discourse and that conversation, this memoir, oh my gosh, it's, it, to a certain extent, it's out there in the world. And um, so I think you just need to think about that and, and, and ask yourself how you might feel about people talking about not just you, but people you know or care about and not talking to you. What, what happens when your business is no longer your business? Mm, mm. What happens when it's book club fodder? Mm -hmm. or it, it belongs to the timeline. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Because I think when that happens, it has nothing to do with you anymore. I thought it was so interesting, like, for example, when, like, um, Taffy Ackner Brodesser, you know, and I can't even remember the specific interview she did, but at one point she did an interview, and this, again, this two lifetimes ago, but she was being candid about, like, career turning points and things she had learned about navigating media as a talented, successful woman, often still having to negotiate against men, and she kept it real, and I appreciated it, but she talked about, like, how much she'd gotten paid at different points. It was an interview. Woo! She was being was interviewed. An interview. Yeah. 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 And it just, it became, like, it seemingly, you know, like a week-long... <laughs> Discourse. I wouldn't be surprised if a book comes out at some point about <laughs> that damn conversation. That was fine, and 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 and, and that's fine. But it had nothing to do with her. In yeah, fact, or, I don't even think she was on work. Twitter. Yeah, you know, I think she was like, oh, I was offline most of that week. I had like a deadline. Yeah. I was like, you know what I mean? And so yeah, I think that's the weird um, contradiction or paradox. I think of personal writing is that when you are finished. And if you are successful, however you might define it, at some point you need to prepare yourself for that success, meaning that it is no longer yours to control. Mm. Um, and, and, and that is understandably weird, you know, and whether that means, you know, for me, I, I, I invested and in, in started taking therapy really seriously in the last two years before the book came out and, and my editor, or excuse me, my editor, my therapist um, was very, yeah, um, was very um, keen on asking me questions about not just how I felt about incidents that appear in the book or things that have happened, but like how I would feel when readers knew about them. Mm, that's a very good question to ask oneself. That's, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, the for me also i you got it so into therapy that it got me into therapy so i deeply appreciate that this is going to be my last question just because we're, okay. we're here and we're in it and then we're going to open up to all these wonderful questions that are pouring in um but so the book comes out you've grappled with all these things that we just talked about so many others that are in interviews that people can read and then you actually go on the road mm. for those other writers in the audience who are maybe close to getting there maybe the book's going to be finished do you have any advice for what it is? Because even everything you're just talking about, right? What it is to open oneself up 
there was a lot of talk about how it consumed online. But mm -hmm. what was it like to go out with your store? I mean, you got interviewed by some incredible people, but you, you went out on the road with your story. Is there any advice you have for people that are doing nightly book events in different cities or what it oh, means gosh. to share yourself in person? Um, Mainly, well, you I, know, I just missed in person. So take us. Uh, same, same. I mean, a, a delight tonight is um, like I can see people like Margaret and Michael, you know, like, hi, hi, you know, um, getting to see people's faces is, is really a joy. Um, everything's weird, you know, um, I, but I, I think I would say the commonality between like traveling and doing like the hardback tour and then the summer doing the paperback tour, which was all done from my living room here in Columbus. Um, I love these events. I, as you know, mm. I, it's, it's a real joy. I love the conversation. Sometimes I feel like I write so I can do the, the Q and A, um, but it's work. Mm -hmm. It is labor. Mm -hmm. And something I've learned is that, like, I know I'm going to be really tired tonight because um, the more I enjoy the event, the more wonderful the, the moderator or the audience is, the more open and the more, thank you, the more you, like, give of yourself, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think it's like, um, oh, I can't, is it Jonathan from Queer Eye? You know I don't watch Queer Eye, but it, Jonathan? I think it's the hair. Oh, right there. I think it's... <laughs> I think it's the hair person. I think they're non-binary, actually. Right. Anyway, one of the Queer Eye people talked about, um, I think they used the language of like an empathy or a vulnerability, a vulnerability hangover. Mm. Um, I would say make space and like not necessarily schedule, but like on the days that I do these events, I don't do much of anything else that day. And that whole day, every time, today included, though I did some errands, it feels like I'm just like joshing around and not being productive enough. But in the long run, I've come to appreciate those days when I was on the road and I would just be in my bed in my hotel robe all day long. Mira Jacob has said she does the same thing. She would just like try to stay in her robe as long as she could um, to rest, mm -hmm. just to rest mm -hmm. because it is a very unique experience. There aren't a lot of people you can talk to about what it's like. And um, you're going to draw from that energy, you know, to have those conversations. That's beautiful. Well, ladies and gentlemen, real quick, we're gonna get to your questions. A quick round of applause for Saeed Jones. That was wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, I'm gonna start with uh, this question from Chandra Steele. Uh, said comment less, more of a comment, less of a question, but I, I think it could be a question. Saeed, your eyeliner, your eyeliner is outstanding. Fenty. That's, that was gonna turn into the, the question. So it's Fenty. Do we know what Fenty it is? I know she has new eyeliners out. Um, I got this gold eyeliner so a couple gold. of years ago. Yeah, gold. it's gold. Gold yeah. Fenty. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. She, I mean, it's, I mean, it's a very simple thing, but I think Fenty uh, and Rihanna, of course, um, figured out, and, and Pat McGrath, but Pat McGrath makeup is so expensive. <laughs> so I think Fenty is a, an affordable uh, makeup brand that actually looks good on different skin tones. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And I love like doing all this, but I can tell you like a lot of gold eyeliner, like it's not gonna show up on black people's skin. Not like, you look fantastic. Not like this. I've got this other question from DCAS, which I think is fantastic. How do you know when to end a memoir? And I think it's fantastic because I know that you, this is something you kind of struggled with. Is it all similar to knowing when to end a poem? Because you did move your end date a little bit, right? You moved around. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. um, ending a poem, I think for me is easy because poems are closer to music. Poems for me begin with um, uh, the title or the first line or the first image, which feels like a lyric that's stuck in my head and it's just like going, 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 going. Um, and yeah, when I'm working on a poem, I, I tend, I don't know where the poem's gonna end when I sit out to write, but it's like, da -da -da -da, and I'm like, oh, oh, you know, like you, you know what that note sounds like. And I think it's, it's pretty clear when you try to push past it and it's like the song is over. What do you? What are you doing? You're like playing um, more after it's done. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. The memoir was hard because it did change. Um, I, it was going to end um, a few weeks into me graduating from college. Um, so that's January or May of, of 2008. And it, it now ends uh, in 
you know, a few months after my mom passed away, several years later. Um, I guess for me, what I eventually figured out, I mean, you know, it's kind of like an image comes to mind and you're like, oh, that's it. But I guess like in term narratively, what emerges is if the title of the book is like how we fight for our lives, you know, the fight never stops. It's, mm-hmm. I, I, I was very aware that I didn't want to write a book with like, and then I lived heavily after, happily ever after everything was, you know, like I, I knew that. So I was trying to make, figure out what had already been covered in the book, what you'd already gotten to see brought to life, and what was like an important idea to capture that hadn't previously appeared that was honest and necessary. And and ultimately I realized that, you know, you see the immediate initial experience of grief. You see me like from the moment my mom goes into the hospital to like the first few weeks and, and the fallout and, and all of that. And, and and grief is so strange over time. And I was like, oh, you don't get to see me like months later when like people stop sending you flowers, your phone isn't ringing off the hook, people aren't constantly checking on you. And so that was interesting to me. And that opened me up to, um, the tentativeness that frankly my, my essay that I read tonight kind of addresses. Mm-hmm. Like I, I, I wanted to show that even after all of this, there is still um, a kind of precariousness that we have after recovering from trauma where we're like, okay, like maybe the world isn't trying to kill me, but like, I don't know if I have the energy in me to keep going. Mm-hmm. And, and what, can, what can we do to tap into that energy? I might be trying to kill myself because of the world, something as, as tough and as difficult as that. I think that's a beautiful answer. I also, just to, just to kind of bring two points of the conversation together, it sounds like to me, it's also just using the metaphor you used earlier, you were like, you found these tentpole moments. Mm-hmm. And of course, learning where, which tentpole to end on is of course difficult, but it was about finding that correct tentpole moment, that last one that you wanted to end on, of mm-hmm. course, the story keeps going. Um, I, I'm going to do a couple more and, and, and then we're going to be done. But uh, I, I thought this was fantastic because we're just right starting. Uh, we're just talking about endings. Starting, when did you, like, just real quick, this, this is a question from Dorothy, which was, when did you knew, know you were ready to even start writing the memoir? I know it was a long, long process for you. But I'd even extend that question to also, like, when did you start writing or start writing poetry? Like, two twofold question, memoir, poetry. When did you... Um, I started writing what we would call now poems in high school. Mm-hmm. I started writing short stories in middle school. I enjoyed them because I was inspired by Clue. So I was I started writing whodunits. Ah, and I enjoyed great. it. I would write. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We watched Clue. Oh, haven't I told you this? We watched Clue, and bitch, I was living for Miss Scarlet. Um, and I think we had like a vocabulary assignment where we needed to write, you know, like a one page thing, you know, using like, I think it was actually the word saunter. It was like, write something with Miss Scarlet and like Miss Scarlet saunters across the room. And then I just started writing stories in my, in my notebook. And this also happened to be, this is like, you know, 1997, 1998, the Scream movies came out. So in that same notebook, I started writing slasher Scream movies and um, I would show them to my friends and my the more I liked you, the more violent your death was. <laughs> oh, whoo, girl. Yeah. So like, you know, it'd be like Isaac, and then he was like stabbed, and then he was run over, and then a plane crashed. <laughs> and I would like show, I would like hand the notebook to friends, you know, in class, like during free time. And they'd be like, this is fucking awesome. Well, then, you know, Columbine happened, quite frankly. And, you know, yeah, I mean, literally, it, and it was, and, you know, teenage boys, with notebooks and violent, you know, was like, oh, and I was like, ah. And then, you know, the next unit was literally like Greek mythology. So I started writing poems for Greek mythology. I was very like transparent. Like I like there, there's there, there's something interesting about like young Saeed, like because he was very like, oh, that does okay, fine, then we'll do this. So I like literally just started like I was Which like a lot of your a lot of your early poetry was learned Greek about mythology. Medusa, and I was like, okay, I guess I'm writing poems about Medusa. Now Medusa. my best friends are being turned into stone. It is what it is. Uh, on that, here are two final questions. Thank you. I okay. know there's, there's so many other questions and you all are asking. Oh my gosh, let me open up. Ah, wonderful questions. Question. You're great. But I thought this was an early question uh, about our friendship. And I'm, I am just going to oh. choose this. It was just like, what's the best part of the friendship? Which I, I personally, I just think it's the love and the support. And I think both of you come from 
lives where maybe we don't have a lot of family support. I don't want to speak for yourself, but, but, but I feel like we show up for each other in a, in a familial way. Think about that for a second. And then it was, how do other folks cultivate such intimacy? Ooh, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think, um, you know, and actually to the question about ending the book, the other thing about the end of the book that I wanted to capture is something that is not possible except for everything that's taken place, in which case it's like me and Esther, this white Canadian woman, and I like just like, not just like hitting it off and having a nice moment, but like vibing deeply, you know, and finally really opening up to each other. And it was because grief kind of flays you. And um, I remember saying something like grief, like it's like all your nerve endings are on the outside and you're just like vulnerable, but maybe also just like more receptive, I think, to people and things in your environment. And yeah, that's how I was when I met Isaac. And I think Isaac, you are, um, I, I think you are just a little bit more receptive and open to your receptivity than I am naturally. I think I'm naturally like, huh, huh. Hot, like, like doing everything I can, you know, it's like, I'm on Twitter, like with the mean face in my avatar and the ferocity and everything, you know, and I think you're just like a little bit more open and like willing to be like, I don't know, like maybe, maybe we're trying our best. <laughs> out here. Maybe we're doing our best, you know. Everybody's and, doing a great job. Yeah, and I think, you know, after losing my mom, I mean, I met you almost a year exactly, I think, or something like that. And I think, for whatever reason, the, the like chemistry was just right. And, and that's what hit it off. And, and I've continued to learn from you. And I think you, um, yeah, I think you, you have, you've evolved, first of all. You are not, yeah. bitch, listen. Ooh, girl. Girl, how much mm. time y'all got? Um, <laughs> you, were, you were not the man I met in mm -hmm. 2012. You're just mm -hmm. not. You are a better man. You are a richer, more substantive, soulful, open, smarter uh, person. You know, you've yeah. learned a lot and um, have figured out how to do that learning in a way that frankly isn't exhausting to me as your black gay best friend. Um, so yeah, yeah. And, and along the way I've learned from you tremendously. I, I can't say enough. Yeah. No, and that's and that is an absolute two way street. And ah, that, a baby. Just for the record, beautiful baby coming in. That question did come from Brenna. I just wanted to say that out loud. So thank you. Oh, Brenna, Brenna. hi! This, uh, before we give it back to Theo and the baby, okay. the one last question that I promised I would ask, so I just have to do it. Uh, it's in the it's in the contract. Uh, why is Hocus Pocus the best movie to watch in October? <gasps> oh wow! <laughs> oh man! Oh God! I mean. Um, to watch Hocus Pocus, first of all, you're watching a movie that like helped a lot of gay dudes understand, before we even knew about drag, understand that we were like living for like what something, we were like something is going on here and we're getting our lives. I also think there's something, it's like the protagonist is a straight white jerk of a man. Mm -hmm. Max sucks. Yeah. And everyone in the film seems to be in agreement about it. And, and he's so upended by everything, you know, like even his little, like it doesn't even make sense, like his little sister being one like a virgin lit the candle, like there's something like just delightfully <laughs> destabilizing. So like he's destabilized and having to learn and trust and respect even from the villains their power. Mm -hmm. as he's you know like it's just you know like he's just like let's light it. like the whole movie happens because he's not taking them seriously right yeah. that's why it starts um and then also i think it's interesting that it's a kid's film in which adults are totally useless the parents the cop the bus driver who just wants to have sex with them. like okay. adults are like just just totally out of the picture and i just think that's really interesting you know what i mean and bet Mid midler kathy najimi and sarah jessica parker's chemistry but they no. don't make white women like that anymore. <laughs> they don't. They really don't. Get into it. It's a beautiful mix. Mm. And with that said, everyone should go watch Hocus Pocus, but we're going to hand it back to Theo. Uh, Do it. One more round of applause for Side Joe. Please. I love you, Isaac. Thank you. Theo, what do you got? Show us a baby. Show us a baby, Theo. Well, we got babies here. We got, we, got, we got a baby. It's close to bedtime, and he's a little delirious, but he's very happy to see everybody. And he was mesmerized by that talk 
Isaac, Saeed, thank you both so much for joining us. That was, um, that was, that was quite a ride. And uh, um, I really appreciate everyone who, who logged on and joined us as well. We, we did do a recording, which is gonna be over on our uh, SFC program uh, YouTube page. So if anyone wants to check it out or feel like they missed something, um, there I, I threw, I put the link in the in the chat. But other than that, um, thank you once again. Peace and love, everyone. Uh, stay safe and and vote. Okay. And, and vote and vote. <laughs> and seriously, thank you to St. Francis College. Theo does so much. The writing program there is fantastic. Don't forget, it is one of the best fucking things. Uh, excuse my language. There's a baby, but it is seriously such a great program. If you're interested, you should absolutely look into it. Love y'all so much. <laughs> and hi, Brenna. I just want to say hello. Hello. Congratulations on the apartment. I love it. Cheers. <laughs> Peace and love. Thank you. Love. Thank you, Theo. All right. Thank you, Isaac.